is April fourteenth, twenty eleven, and we are interviewing Mr. Linkless at the Communication Center at Buena Vista University. What was the question, please? Uh, when were um, you enlisted? Okay, nineteen thirty-eight. What were you doing before you got? Uh, yes, I enlisted in nineteen thirty-eight, and I'll be ninety-two before Christmas. So you, I kind of feel ancient when I get when I get in this young crowd, but. So uh, I really don't have a lot of engagements, only one major one, but so uh, it'll be kind of a, my scenario is more of how the Navy was then rather than how it is now or, or was after the war started. But So I may throw in a few, you know, how that was. Okay. Or do you want me to continue or, or you got a question? <laughs> Um, where were you when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Were you there? Well, I, th I think I'd like to go into a little of the prehistory before the scenario so you know where my position. Okay, I enlisted in 1938, and uh, at that time, you know, the Navy always took uh, what they call their manu maneuvers. So in, 1930, in, in 1938, or enlisted in the, 19, in the spring of 1939, and of course went through the canal, and the maneuvers in 1939 was was off the Cape Verde Islands off the west coast of Africa. So that was interesting. And when we left Africa, we came back uh, to New York, and that was the World's Fair that year in New York in 1939. That was the World's Fair. And we were there about, about a month. And when I was in New York, it wasn't any bigger than Storm Lake then, you know. <laughs> you don't believe that, of course. But anyway, after we left New York, we uh, went to Cuba and Puerto Rico and, ver and various islands, and then back through the canal and back up to Bremerton, Washington. And in that, in, from 39 to 41, we did uh, a lot of maneuvers, generally in the Pacific, and spent a lot of time in the islands, per, uh, primarily in, in Honolulu. Uh, that, so that kind of takes care of that from, from 38 to to 41, if you got a question, we can continue from there. We can go ahead. Can you tell us about um, your training? Your training? Our training? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, well, in 1938, the training station was in Gulfport, Mississippi, in San Diego, California. I went through the training station in uh, Great Lakes, Illinois. 21, we got $21 a month for the first six months. And then, boy, after a year, you got up to 36 if you behaved yourself and doing good. So there was there was no no big pay in the in the navy then. Do you have any um, specific memories from the uh, like the work or the drills that you may have done? Well, <laughs> oh, I can't think of anything that really you know is outstanding. It, it was just a job, you know. At that time, you know, in '38, that was. Just kind of after the hard times, you you was lucky to have a job, you know, twenty twenty one dollars a month with room and board. That that was a bonanza at that time, and uh, I didn't have an opportunity to go to college or anything. I finished high school, like everybody does, it seems like. <laughs> what made you decide to um, enlist in the Navy? Beg pardon. What made you decide to enlist in the Navy? I'm sorry, I still. What made you decide to enlist in the Navy? Oh, golly, I always wanted to travel, and it was a job. <laughs> I guess you'd say primarily a job because, you know, in, in 38, that was just after the really hard hard Depression years, and there just wasn't, uh, unless you had means to go to college, but, of course, I didn't have any means to go to college. So I, uh, my opinion of it was, hey, that's a, that's a job to take, room and board and $21 a month. That, that's a good deal. What happened after training? After training? Mm -hmm. Well, I stayed on. I was on the. I was on the battleship Tennessee for over five years. But, it, of course, now we're about ready to get to Pearl Harbor. I guess. See, you know, your yeah. question. Yeah. Um, so you said in 1941 you were in Honolulu. Oh yes. So can you elaborate a little bit more about that? What did you do while you were there? And. The bomb. Well, of course, we just, like I said, the Navy went into maneuvers every summer. They always had maneuvers, oh, two, three times a year and go to different islands and stuff. And we'd just come into to Pearl Harbor about two or three days before, and uh, we were tied up uh, 
Uh, really, uh, they call it Pearl Harbor, but it's Ford Island, actually, is a technical area, it's Ford Island. And we were tied up with that eight or nine battleships, I can't remember them all now, but there was the Tennessee and the California and the New Mexico and the, and the Idaho and the Maryland. And boy, hmm. right now I can't, I can't really remember them all, but, uh, and we were tied on the port side of the, of the West Virginia, and that's what saved us because the West Virginia was on our port side or on our left, and they, t they took the torpedoes and we just took fire powder on top side. We got a couple of light bombs and machine fire. So we, we lost, uh, lost a few guys, but the West Virginia is one that really took the, the brunt of it as far as we were concerned. And then of course up ahead, you know, was the Oklahoma and the Arizona and all those that really in the Pennsylvania, that was another ship that was there. They, they all took a lot of damage. We didn't have near the damage that we did and the casualties were light. So we called it a bad hair day. Oh, sure, I knew a lot of guys. See, at that time, you know, the ships didn't, you know, they didn't have a whole lot of manpower. We only had 1,200 men, but shortly after the war, why well, they, they got another 800 men on our ship so we could have more relief, you know, from, from our duties and whatnot. And I was a machinist mate in the engine room. And uh, the, you want to know just when it happened? Is that what we're talking about now then? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, well, okay. I'd had the Ford, I had the Ford, what they call the 48 watch, and well, there was 48 in the four afternoon to 8 in the evening, and then likewise 4 a.m. To, to 8 a.m. And I happened to have the 48, 48 uh, period watch in the engine room, and uh, my friend relieved me a little early, so I just got up to topside a few minutes, and I hadn't uh, had even breakfast yet, and I heard uh, these planes and bombs, and I thought it was what they call a dummy run, you know, and I looked out the porthole, and gosh, the, the Japanese planes were so low that uh, you, you could see the pilots in them, you could see the, the bombs dropping on Fort Island, you know, where they had all the aircraft, and the, the planes were blowing up, and, and the ships were, were blowing, and, uh, and of course, just shortly after I was looking out the porthole, about now I had a, one shipmate said he, he saw the pilots waving. I read that in the paper too. He saw the pilots in the, in the Japanese aircraft waving at us. And I suppose maybe they were, they were that low. I suppose the, day, the aircraft, they were low. I'd say, oh gosh, well under a thousand foot. So you, you could see them very visibly. Uh, what was your reaction to the attack? Beg pardon? What was your reaction to the attack? My what? Your reaction. Oh, <laughs> surprise. I, I couldn't hardly believe it. Like I said, I thought it was just a dummy run. And boy, I looked out the porthole and down at Fort Island, the, the aircraft was already, blow, already blowing up and, and uh, the, you could hear the bombs continuing. Of course, at that time, uh, what they call, uh, oh, I'm trying to think. Man your battle stations, I guess that's the term for it. And I uh, immediately returned to the engine room and we, to keep the power, to, you know, to the turbines and everything up, and we stayed. All of us that was in the engine room, we stayed there till late afternoon, before we come up. And then, when you seen all the devastation and destruction, well, it was in disbelief. You just couldn't believe it. Yeah. And of course, uh, continuing there, the the harbor was pretty much a, a blaze. And of course, you had to keep, you know, keep your propellers, you know, to keep the water and oil, you know, in movement, so to keep the ships from catching more on fire. And uh, that, that went on for, oh, two, three days, it did that oil business. And uh, so we just fought fires and, and this and that. And we didn't, uh, we didn't get out of the, out of Pearl Harbor till about the, oh, about the 10th of January or so. And at that time, in thinking, you know, as far as I know, there was, there was no passenger air flights from the States to Honolulu. And there was two, uh, there was two steamships, uh, the, the SS Loreline and the Mariposa, I remember them then, I remember the names of them yet, because they carried the, the fleet post office for the Pacific Fleet was in San Francisco. And those two ships would always bring in our mail to, to the fleet when we were in, in Honolulu. And uh, they, they, one of them, I don't remember if the Mariposa or the Laura Line was at the harbor, in the harbor at the time uh, at the attack. But when we went back to the States for a quick trip there in uh, the fore part of January, why we, we acted as the escort for, 
for this uh, passenger ship. And uh, we escorted them to San Francisco, and then we went back up to uh, Bremerton, Washington. It, it was quite obvious that we needed more aircraft, so we, uh, we put on some bigger machine guns. And it was a caliber they called a Bofors 1.1. I don't know. It's a pretty good sized caliber machine gun. And uh, we were, so in about, uh, oh, it must have been probably about in February of 42, why uh, the Tennessee and I don't know what, and some destroyers, I don't know what else, we were deployed up to the Lucian Islands. And, and the reason the ships were deployed up to the Lucian Islands, I understood at that time, and I guess it's still, you can still read it in history books, but the, the thinking was in the military that, uh, that Japan would attack the United States via the Lucian Islands. And what really happened, how come the Alaska, you heard of the Alaska Highway? That was, they started building that primarily because they thought Japan was going to attack the United States from the Aleutian Islands, and that's why they needed a, a road to get up to the Aleutian Islands to fight the, the attack to, of the Japanese or whoever might be with them, you know, to come to the United States. So uh, we were up there. The weather was just terrible in the Aleutian Islands. In fact, we lost one of our planes and never, never got it back. Uh, uh, it, the weather was just terrible. So I think we were oh, patrolling up there maybe for about a month more or less. And then we went back out to the South Pacific and we did escort work primarily. Uh, our ship and others did escort work in the, in the South Pacific until I was on that until it would have been late of 1942. And then the ship went back to Bremerton, Washington for major repairs, we needed we needed <laughs> remodernization. In fact, they changed the sil silhouette, I guess you'd call it, of the ship entirely. I'm I'm sorry I didn't bring pictures along of the of the restoration and whatnot. I have a lot of that material, and I suppose I'm, I can add. You know, you're probably aware. Of it. You know, there's oodles of books and pictures. You know, on on Pearl Harbor. I, I never took any of them. I had enough vivid memories of Pearl Harbor, so I didn't. Uh, I've never went to that Tora Tora, I believe they call that one of the movies, you know, that portrayed Pearl Harbor so, so vividly. But uh, I, have, I have material on that. And uh, so in the, then in the fall of 42, when the ship was at Pearl Harbor for remodernization, I was transferred to the East Coast and I put in commission a new minesweeper, the YMS 401. And uh, that was a, a minesweeper for submarine patrol. And a lot of people didn't know it at the time, but they found out afterwards. You know, there were submarines printing all over the world, and uh, we uh, we did uh, submarine patrol all through the West Indies and down to down to South America. And uh, after about two years on this minesweeper, I was uh, transferred uh, to in that would have been in the fall of uh, mm -hmm, 40, 45, yeah, the fall of forty five. I was transferred to uh, back to the East Coast, and uh, I was sent to uh, a diesel uh, diesel marine trading school in uh, in Norfolk, uh, Virginia, to to teach uh, diesel marine engine uh, engineering to uh, students there at the school. And of course, then the war ended when I was there at Norfolk at the training school, and and uh, after about eight years. The joke was they called it a canoe club. So after about eight years in the canoe club, why well, uh, I had gotten married. Well, I'd met my uh, my wife when I was in when I was in high school. In fact, we were to we were together for seven. When my wife passed away, we had been together. She don't we'd only lacked about a month. We'd been together for seventy years. We weren't married. Then. We were married for over sixty-five years, but we were together for seventy years. They were from from nine. Our first acquaintance in 1937 to uh, uh, 2007, yeah, just like a little bit of 70 years. So boy, I'm still lost. Uh, how did you feel about America entering World War II after Pearl Harbor? Oh, I was a real big flag waver then, you know. <laughs> but uh, I'm sort of a dove now. You see, uh, you know, I guess it's been said a lot of times, you know, if all the leaders of the world actually had to go into battle themselves, and that includes every leader that I've ever read about, I don't think we'd be having the wars that we're having. Uh, you mentioned that uh, your wife now, 
she was your high school sweetheart. Um, how did she react to you joining the service? Oh, we were we were just you know good acquaintance then. She thought <laughs> I don't think she could have changed my mind <laughs> at that time anyway. Yeah. So so it was just one of those deals. So uh, we were just super close friends and and uh, she she went to uh, a business school in Des Moines and then later on she went to newspaper work in uh, oh, I can't think of the town in uh, in California. Mm -hmm. But anyway later on. Uh, then she worked in uh, an insurance firm in uh, in Seattle, Washington, and uh, we spent time together in uh, when she was working for, uh, for this insurance firm. And the insurance firm that she was working working for, they were the big carriers that was insuring the people that was building this Alaskan highway. It's just a bit of interest thing there about it. Yeah. And of course, when I got transferred to the East Coast, her parents in Elber City, they were longtime farmers and kind of almost pioneers of Elber City. They wanted her, they were, you know, a lot of people thought the Japanese was going to attack the United States. That was a common thought at that time. Yeah, and, you know, they even imprisoned all the Japanese people, you know, you read about that. And uh, they wanted her back in Elber City. So she left her insurance job and uh, came, came back to Elber City. And then when I got out of the Navy, why then I went into, uh, I worked in the power plant in Algona, uh, diesel diesel engine power plant in Algona, and uh, and in the spring of '46, my father-in-law helped me get started farming, and uh, and here I am. <laughs> Oh yeah, it, it, the communication, you know, was slow. Yeah, you know, because uh, uh, when I got transferred, well, even when the after the war started, you know, their uh, y your mail was censored. If you wrote a letter, it was censored before they before it even leave the ship. Yep, and uh, so I didn't write anything too wild, but I'm but I know there was a time, whatever I, I wrote or said, why well, then they'd clip it out. So that she, so that uh, whoever got hold of the letter, they had no idea where the ship was or what it was doing. So it was censored mail, definitely. Uh, what else do you remember about uh, life after Pearl Harbor? Well, you mean the remaining time in the Navy? You mean mm -hmm. what do I remember? Yep. Oh, damn! That was hard duty, boy. <laughs> and the minesweepers. Boy, you talk about rough. Oh gosh, you know, battleship. That that's pretty easy. But you get on those minesweepers, about 80 foot long, and and half the time you can't even. You know, the dishes are going everywhere. You know, on the tables they got you got you got railings around. You know, to keep the dishes on, <laughs> keep the dishes on the table. But so yeah, that was a, that was, that was hard duty. And I tell you, you didn't do much drinking ashore if you ever got ashore, because boy, you'd be so you'd really be sick riding a minesweeper if you'd been drinking. I'll tell you that. <laughs> probably shouldn't, you know, probably shouldn't be telling you my my black side, huh? <laughs> How did you adjust from going from um, the shore to or from the ship to the minesweeper? From ship to where? To the minesweeper. How did you adjust? Oh boy, the nudie was so darn rough. Oh boy, My, and it was just a you know minesweepers aren't very big. The duty is tough, and the and the quarters are small, and yeah, that's another thing I, I had to tell you. You know, in the navy then, the recruits and whatnot, or the, until you got to maybe be a first class machine, you slept in hammocks. You tied them to the, you tied them to the ceilings, in the compartments. You slept in a hammock. You're talk, you were talking about um, adjusting from a battleship to a minesweeper, and can you tell us about the quarters that you lived in and stayed in on the minesweeper? Oh boy, they were very, very small. You, you had bunks on the bulkhead, you know, but boy, there wasn't much room on there, and the duty is so rough, and what a minesweeper, what they do that was for submarines, and what, the, what they used to detect submarines, because you, you had all that radar equipment, and uh, the minesweepers are with what they call, uh, mm, gosh, I'm trying to think what we called them, but they were depth charges, about the size of, oh, about the size of that trash barrel, a depth charge. And what that would do, uh, 
if it's close enough to a submarine, it'll, it'll, it'll damage the submarine enough so it'll come to the surface. Now, I don't know if we ever got one or not. One, we had kind of a, <laughs> a captain that was kind of, I don't know about that guy either. But anyway, he, he thought we did get one submarine. But like I said, we'd go clear down to South America and all over. And you know, the submarines were all over the world. It's hard to believe, but they were. So I, I don't know if we ever got one or not, but I know we definitely, we, 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 but those depth charges, it, it's kind of interesting, you know, when they blow up in the water, boy, it's just like a volcano, and it, it'll destroy any underwater craft if it, if it happens to be, you know, in the area where, where that depth charge goes off. Uh, do you have any other um, memorable experiences on the minesweeper? On the minesweeper? Mm-hmm. Well, other than it was rough duty, <laughs> primarily, <laughs> and we stopped in a lot of places. Oh, I might say, yeah, and uh, we've been to the different islands, and in, in 39, when we went back to Cuba and Puerto Rico and whatnot, and I always remember, you know, they had all this uh, hurricane, what was it, you know, in Puerto Rico, in Port-au-Prince, you know, and I, I thought then, of all the places I've been, Puerto Rico, I thought, was the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere that I was ever in. It was just, it was, it was a pathetic then, and I'm sure it's worse now, after all the trouble they've had there in uh, Port-au-Prince, because that's where our ship come in. In fact, uh, in, the, in the harbor, the, the little the kid well I said the little kids um, they'd swim out to the they'd swim out to the ships and we'd throw you know fruit and different stuff to them you know everybody was hungry then and they still are now you know Puerto Rico is a poor country. Uh, what other um, duties did you have on the minesweeper? Oh, just uh, I was in charge of the generators. Three cylinder generators that furnished the power, and we had two main, two main large diesel engines. They were what they called the two. They were a two six two, uh, and they had eight inch cylinders. And we started them with with air pressure, with uh, compressed air to turn them over. You didn't have electric starters. You turned them over with compressed air. Yeah. And what did you do after your um, time on the minesweeper? After the minesweeper? Well, that's where I went to this diesel school in Norfolk and was an instructor in, in marine diesel engines. And then, of course, that was in the, in the end of, you know, I have to even stop thinking when the war ended in 40, 40, 45. Yeah, yeah in, in the 45. And uh, that's when I, I decided that uh, we should, uh, should leave the Navy and kind of be, be together. And that's when I went to work in a power plant in, Algo in, in Algona, Iowa. And uh, after a few months in Algona, that's where my father-in-law helped me get started farming in Elber City. And we farmed for 40 years, and uh, I retired at, I retired at, at 62. And uh, then we, d we did some traveling, which included the casinos. I like the casinos. I probably shouldn't say that. You might be casino fans, but, you know, I, uh, uh, I like the casinos. I don't go anymore now, but... Uh, I was never a big loser at the casino between the two of us. Why, it was a good deal. <laughs> and uh, so that's I say I retired at uh, I retired at 62, and we did some traveling and primarily on on bus trips to. And then of course, uh, uh, I had two sons who were both medical doctors from Yale and Harvard, and uh, the one at uh, the the Harvard the, the the surgeon that was at Harvard, and the, our son that was a surgeon that from Harvard, he got killed in a plane crash as a teaching student in a, of, of, of surgery, and he had his own plane. But we still have the son out in, uh, in San Francisco, and he, uh, he thinks like the new people do now. They've been together for over 30 years, not married and no children. So uh, we, <laughs> we went out there for, for, tw for, for, 12, for 12 seasons, and, uh, and then of course, shortly, well, we couldn't go there anymore, my wife wasn't able to travel anymore, and like I say, she just passed away three years ago, three years ago. But she liked two months of being together for seventy years. I keep saying that, but boy, uh, it, it just it never left me. <laughs> uh, did you ever see battle again after Pearl Harbor? Big pardon? Did you ever see battle again after? 
No, no, we did con we did uh, primarily uh, convoy work. Uh, we we were in the Pacific when the when the Lexington and the Saratoga both got sunk. You know, they were two huge carriers. They were, the U.S. had three big carriers. I was trying to think of the third big carrier we had uh, at the start of the war, but I can't think of it right now. But uh, they both got sunk. And we were in the area, but we did primarily escort duty. Uh, we weren't in, we weren't actually in the battle. We were in the area, but uh, we weren't uh, uh, any part of the attack. Was there any um, specific reaction uh, among the others in your um, in your outfit or anything? Was there any reaction to the Japanese? Well, I can tell you a true little bit as far as myself. I'm not a praying man, but I prayed that night after Pearl Harbor. <laughs> I don't know if that, <laughs> but, the, but uh, you want to know the reaction? Well, it, it was gun ho. We were all big flag wavers. We were all uh, like the, you know, like the, in the, it was Benito Fernito, you know, when, uh, uh, let's see, Benito Rosalino, let's see, he was the, uh, of Italy. What was the Prime Minister, or whatever you call it, of Italy in 1930 and 41? Wasn't that Benito or something like Benito that? Benito Mussolini. Yeah, Mussolini, yeah. So we, we'd say Benito Finito or whatever, Mussolini, Benito Molise, Mussolini. <laughs> so we were out to get everybody, but it took a while to do it. But it's not dragging on like the wars we got now. So I'm kind of a dove now because uh, I, I've been through that. I, um, I don't understand this having. Uh, military and personnel all over the world and billions and billions of dollars and you guys are going to have to pay for that. I'm getting Social Security. I'm not paying for it, but you guys are. You have a interesting nickname. People call you Stubb. Yeah, okay. The, the name, nickname. Okay, my folks immigrated from Sweden. They were sweethearts in Sweden and they come over in this country, I, I believe, in about 1914. And when I started school, of course, my folks, all they could talk was Swedish, and they settled in Nebraska because Dad's brother had come over earlier. Don't ask me why or how, but he'd come over earlier, and my folks were sweethearts in Sweden, and Skoning was the province. And uh, so when I started school, all I could talk was, was Swedish. Okay, so the kids thought I was too stubborn to talk English, so they just started calling me Stub for Stubborn. But hell, they didn't know. I didn't know any English. <laughs> All I could talk was Swedish. <laughs> so that's how I got the name Stubborn. It just stuck with me. I'm not stubborn, just contrary. Uh, what did you go on to do after uh, you were discharged? Beg pardon? What did you go on to do after you were discharged? Oh, then I started farming. Didn't I cover that? <laughs> yeah, I went to work in the power plant. <laughs> Oh, no, no, no. I went right uh, right to the power plant after I got out of the service. Oh, I guess it was a couple, a couple of months. And then I was looking for a power plant job. Or, and that's when I went up to Algona and they hired me on the spot because I was, I was familiar with diesel engines and they were looking for help then. So I worked in that power plant from, oh, about six months or so. And then my father-in-law wanted me to get started uh, farming. And uh, his theory was, you know, you don't want to carry a lunch basket to work. You want to own the property yourself. And that was kind of his theory, and it, it worked out all right. In fact, we bought that farm for $200 an acre, and uh, that was considered pretty, in fact, my own folks, and I had some relatives, oh, you'll never make it at $200 an acre. And boy, look where it went. And we, we've got uh, farms selling within oh, a mile or two of us that are bringing five, $6,000 an acre now. It's crazy, <laughs> but I'm keeping mine. <laughs> uh, what were you most proud of? What am I most proud of? My two boys going to Yale and Harvard. Yep, yep. And to think they're still, uh, like I say, the, uh, the older son that was a, was a surgeon at Harvard. He was the chief resident surgeon for two years at Harvard. And then he went into private practice with, with, a, with another surgeon in Fitchburg, Massachusetts. And uh, his partner died. And they wanted, uh, the, his partner's family wanted uh, Clyde to, uh, to buy the practice, but he wanted to get back to, uh, to Iowa home. He, he still was a country, country boy. And uh, when he got, he got back here, 
and uh, he was uh, then then he went to and got into the hospital at Fort Dodge and he was the director of, of emergency uh, emergency medicine at the, at the Trinity Regional in Fort Dodge until he got killed in a plane crash. He had his own plane and uh, he did teaching assignments in trauma surgery and he'd fly to Sioux Falls and, and, Mason, and Mason City and he even did teaching in Iowa City on trauma surgery. And he got caught in a wind shear one night and we lost him. And uh, when, when uh, he, they were married for 17 years before, or 15, yeah, let's see what, it, it was either 15 or 17 years before they, before they had their first baby. And the little girl was only uh, two years old when he got killed. And uh, it, it's been a hard deal, but we were in a position. And uh, his wife, she never remarried. And she's been a teacher at the college in Fort Dodge for, for several years after the, after the, the, or she could get a baby, you know, she took care of the little girl till she was, could get a babysitter for her. And she went because uh, she, uh, she taught school in Riverside, Iowa, while, uh, while Clyde was in, uh, at the University of Iowa at the medical school. And uh, she, she taught then. And after the, she could get a little babysitter, why uh, she got, into the college at the, you know, they're in Fort Dodge or what they call a community college or whatever. In fact, they've got a unit here in Buena Vista too, haven't they? Yeah, and, uh, and she's still teaching there and uh, she's, uh, had, she had a little tough luck. She'll be 65 next year. And then lo and behold, last year here, she come down with breast tumor ready to retire. But she's taken all her radiation and chemotherapy and just finished that here in January. And uh, hopefully they, she went through the, a lot of work at Rochester and whatnot, and they tell her she's getting along fine. However, she's still on med medication and whatnot, and we're still hoping for the best on that, but she's uh, doing okay. She's back to teaching and whatnot, yeah. So that's the tough part of my story. You know, I used to think, you know, okay, here now here's some of my philosophy, and I don't know if you call it that or not, but you know, all the time when I was farming, you know, things were tough. We didn't, like I said, we didn't even have electricity, to do it. and I thought, boy, this is the terrible part of, of of life, or whatever you want to call it. And oh boy, it'll be good when you get old and retired. But you know, it's just the other way around. That was the good years when I had the family and everything. Now, now it's the tough years when you're old and you're alone. And that, uh, there's no joke on that. That's the hard part. If you can imagine being with somebody for 70 years and then they're gone. Yep, but. Uh, they tell me I'm getting along okay. I do the best I can, like they say. So any, I can, I don't know. I, if you got any questions, go ahead. <laughs> Just stay out of the military. Because <laughs> I'm not the flag waver I used to be. Boy, I've seen that stuff and it shouldn't be. Uh, is there any other stories you can share with us? Any stories? Well, no, no, you know, like I say, my my history, my service, you know, was mostly during peacetime. The only other real engagement I was in, see, was Pearl Harbor. And then, of course, up at the Aleutian Islands. After that, we primarily, did, all we did is escort work in the, in the South Pacific. And then, of course, the, the tough part was this, uh, was that uh, minesweeper duty. That was, that was a hard duty, but... So, I don't have any other really other experiences it was oh <laughs> a few a few liberties on shore and whatnot but that that's history too <laughs>